happy to give this talk. Um, I'm actually a postdoc at WashU working with uh, Arpana Agarwal um, and as an analyst on the PGC substance use disorder group. And every year the substance use disorder group meets with the NIDA Animal Genetics Consortium in order to kind of align our findings. And um, typically the PGC talks always go kind of the same way. We applied X method, found X number of loci, and we report that to the animal people who often um, don't have like an easily accessible way to reach our research. Now, an another thing we often do in the PGC, which is why I like the PGC so much, is we see um, great work like that being done by the people in the session and that each of these individuals has like something we'd want to bring into our GWAS. And so we do that in mass, just like we do GWAS. So the point of this talk is kind of to be a baton pass. So let me just to the researchers who are doing kind of other work that can contextualize the findings that we have and show that the PGC kind of looks at these in mass and then give these kind of in mass results to others in something that's interpretable. I think that tobacco and alcohol is probably one of the best places to start in terms of this type of research because we know that there's a huge global burden for tobacco and alcohol. And even though use disorder deaths have been increasing throughout the world recently, we know that alcohol use in particular accounts for almost half of those. So alcohol use or alcoholism, right? So it's a great place to start. Um, however, we do have several different types of, uh, we have several different types of uh, clinical trials that have been ongoing before in the past for addiction. And very few of these have been successful, right? However, we know that GWAS targets are three times enriched for pharmacological targets, and they present an interesting area to start like kind of drug repositioning in the future. And then, um, but very few GWAS hits are currently being used in animal research. Um, there are some key caveats to this. For example, there are knock-ins of the human CHRNA5 variant. So that is the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor gene. Um, and that increases uh, kind of mouse nicotine consumption behavior. And then there's also, um, our group is currently carrying out some evidence with LD score and MAGMA, similar to the last talk, where we look at discovered variants from both um, human models, which is GWAS, and animal models, which is like outbred models, and uh, these kinds of expression studies. And we're finding some small but significant overlap in the discovered genes. So there, there's potential for us to do good work um, in this collaborative space and genes that we're already discovering, but we haven't started to utilize these two fields um, jointly yet. So I'm gonna focus on four main phenotypes, um, cigarettes per day, uh, smoking cessation, drinks per week, and problematic alcohol use, which is the PGC like kind of meta-analysis that was done by Joel Gelertner's lab that includes um, both dependence diagnosis, use disorder diagnosis from the MVP, and the audit, um, the audit test items, the, or called the audit P, which I believe Abe Palmer will probably talk about later in his talk. Right, so you have kind of your GWAS and you have all of these little dots that represent some sort of meeting. And for substance use, if you look over at chromosome 15, you'll notice that we have some SNPs that have incredibly large effects in comparison to the rest of uh, psychiatric genetics, right? So, you know, we go about as uh, the last talk talked about, the last two talks talked about, and that is kind of annotating your GWAS. For those that are unfamiliar, um, Twitter is a form of digital annotation where you're hashtagging your SNPs to find patterns. And so we go about annotating every SNP um, in the genome, not just you know, those that we have a pre-existing hypothesis for, which typically is, is fantastic research in a way that we kind of start doing this research, but then the PGC kind of cannibalizes it and does it for every SNP. We often do this for things like nearest gene, functional consequence, and then a lot of the things that have been talked about in these previous talks, the biological pathways, enhancer promoter relationships, and various EQTLs. Right. And so uh, here's another GWAS um, Manhattan plot, and this one's the one for drinks per week. And in this um, image, the lead SNP has been annotated for the nearest gene. However, when we go further into the functional annotations, we find similar results that, to that in the rest of biology. There are significant amount of exonic SNPs, thankfully, for substance use. But we also have a lot of intronic variants, right? So these intronic variants um, are probably are characterizing a lot of the SNPs that we discover. So if you're a GWAS analyst and you have all of these different biological mechanisms, then there's kind of these phases that we're going through to evaluate the annotated SNPs. And these are kind of, this is the type of information we want to give out when we say we have X number of SNPs and the SNP has X evidence, right? And so we've created this kind of just 
pyramid um, to go along with some of the stuff that we're producing for people in other fields to explain the phases that you kind of go through when you're looking at a GWAS and the degree of evidence it takes to implicate that particular loci. So for example, um, the first and the top of the pyramid is just that this is an independent exonic SNP and it's a QTL. You have a solid understanding of its pathway to biology. Uh, think back yesterday to Arpana Agarwal's talk where she talked about the ADH1B gene, which is involved in alcohol metabolization. That is a huge effect on both drinks per week and um, alcoholism. And that's because it deals with the metabolization of alcohol. And in addiction research, we have several of these genes and we point them out quite frequently. Um, next is of course those SNPs that are um, in high LD with exonic variants and that are also cis EQTLs. Um, for example, uh, it's thought that one of the mechanisms for ketamine is that it improves executive function. And in executive functioning GWAS, there are not any particular SNPs that target the, um, the intronic, the exonic variants on those NMDA receptors, but there are introns that are close by and are cis EQTLs, right? So there's some evidence that that might be working from kind of a GWAS perspective as well. Um, the third kind of phase is integrating this information about the histone wrapping. Um, almost every previous talk has mentioned this. It's a new exciting area because you know this is when we start to get into, okay, we have intronic variants. They aren't close to a gene. What is happening here? Um, so the previous talks focused individually on particular genes, but you can actually integrate information using new methods such as HMAGMA, which came out this year across all of these different variants and try to get like, okay, this is the predicted expression based on these enhancer promoter relationships. So I have a little diagram, but I liked everyone else's diagrams a little bit better. So you can look at those. Um, and we'll often plot the kind of uh, enhancer promoter relationships of all SNPs. So e again, just like a Manhattan plot, each dot is a SNP on this image. And then we've plotted them in a circle so that we can draw these orange lines, which are the long range relationships between genes. And then these green lines, which are kind of those close range relationships. We quantify those and then give you back some sort of value for the expression patterns as a degree of explanation for that gene. And then finally, the last level, um, which requires, I, I think the most information is when we combine information from multiple fields and multiple SNPs, which are things like gene burden tests done in magma, using prior information from pathway analyses to discover genes, um, methods like Mendelian randomization and SMR that are essentially giving us information on whether this transcript is causal for a gene. And of course, TWAS, imputing the information from multiple SNPs and EQTL data um, into the prediction of a gene, All right? So we have all of these different levels um, of analysis and we have all of these different genes, but we also need to be careful of the confounding associations amongst the genes. And that is because just because a gene is significant does not mean that it is the, the strongest signal, right? So if you look back at CHRNA5 gene on chromosome 15, that CHRNA variant is pulling up a lot of genes that may or may not be involved in the etiology of the trait. Right, they're pulling, some of them are other CHRNA genes, other genes that deal with nicotine metabolization. So they might be involved, right? So at the top level, we also often do um, co-localization or conditional analyses just to discover, you know, which particular individual SNP is the one that we'd like to focus on, right? So that's kind of, you know, the phases that a lot of GWAS analysts go through these perspectives. Um, I'm just gonna give you some quick annotation results. So first, those independent exonic SNPs and QTLs. I've been harping on addiction traits because you know they have a lot of these, um, and those are the, these are those genes right here. So if you look again over at cigarettes per day, we have CHRNA three, four, and five, which all deal with nicotine metabolization. Um, CYP two, A six, and seven again metabolizing genes, but also some other genes that deal with processes um, like, for example, HIST one H two BE, which probably has something to do with histone acetylation or at least processes with the histone. And then, you know, if we look over at problematic alcohol use in the middle there, we have ADH1B, but other genes that deal with uh, different metabolizing pathways, not just those in implicated in alcohol, right? And so we're very lucky in addiction research to have these. They all have incredibly large effects that with p-values orders of magnitude smaller than most in psychiatric uh, genetics. And then we can annotate each of those for what the top uh, drug target is for that drug. So blue is from Open Target's website and um, the magenta color is from Drug Bank. Those colors were chosen because those are the banners for the website. And if you look at CHRNA4 and um, ADH1B and C, 
those drugs are already known to treat those particular conditions, right? So our top hits are targeted by drugs that already treat um, addiction issues. However, there are several drugs that are either experimental or treat other conditions that might be useful in treating these particular conditions, right? So this is an opportunity for drug repositioning. We both have signal from things we know work and signal from things that like might potentially work. And that's that kind of opens up for larger scale study of addiction research. Now we can go into any of these other phases. And uh, this is where we start to get into the, we have you know, X number of loci for each of these phases. Um, and if I did, then I'd be going through hundreds of loci. So I'm not going to go through them in particular, uh, but in order to give people access to that information, we're developing a shiny app that will present the information for each uh, gene. And you can actually Google interactively or Google or search for each gene and the degree of information that comes from each of these methods. Um, and then in the, you can actually sort the data frame by your particular method. Finally, in the farthest uh, column, you'll see that we've actually organized the data also by those phases so that individuals can just sort if you want only phase one genes or if you're interested in a particular method like you're interested in histone acetylation, you can look for um, those genes that are most significant using uh, H magma. We're also going to link out to websites like FUMA, which did a lot of the SNP-based analysis, Open Targets, Drug Bank, and Drug Gene Interaction Database so that you can know kind of what drugs and what systems of drugs target those particular genes and the mouse brain atlas to help the animal researchers that we're attempting to communicate with. So several conclusions. First, there are a lot of exonic variants comparatively for addiction research. These are largely in metabolizing and receptor pathways. Um, known addiction treatments do seem to target these hits. And so there's some potential there for drug um, repositioning. But as we move past just the exonic SNPs, we might even be able to do profiling later on. And finally, these are relatively large effects for GWAS of psychiatric traits. So addiction research seems like an excellent place to start this kind of genomics-based drug repositioning because we do have some evidence that it, at least that the effect sizes are larger and that we are targeting known pathways. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge everyone that's a collaborator on this research, um, particularly Spencer Huggett and MSC Johnson. And I would like to also thank the PGC Substance Use Disorder Group. All three of the directors were involved in some way in this research, and of course, the funding agencies. Any questions? And if you have any, feel free to tweet them if you don't want to ask them in this public forum. Um, Alex, thank you very much for this beautiful talk and really succinct summary as well of all the uh, causal inference and functional consequence methods that are out there. I do apologize uh, for that mishap. Uh, it seems our annotation information on you was quite outdated. Uh, so uh, that was my bad, my mistake. Um, I do think we have a question that I believe is for you that was sent via the chat to the panel. So I'll, I'll pose that to you. Um, does one really draw a conclusion on causal effect using SMR approach? Um, the original paper seemed to say that they cannot differentiate between causal and pleiotropic effect. Right. Um, I'm, so SMR was an example of a method that uses Mendelian randomization um, for, for discovering expression loci. Um, that, what I'm trying to say in that is essentially that you can use um, more complex statistical models that are, are made to test causality. Um, I think that those methods are currently being developed. I'm not harping on just SMR as the only one, um, just offering an example of one that uses MR. <laughs>